Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Head of Performance at Bristol Rugby, Mark Bennett. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by SimplyFaster.com and that's spelled S-I-M-P-L-I Faster.com. So alongside the free lap timing systems, SimplyFaster.com currently holds the eccentric K-Box. So if you haven't heard of the K-Box, it's a new product that uses flywheel technology to allow higher velocity eccentric overload. So I saw the K-Box for the first time when Mike Young from the US brought a couple over for one of his workshops in Gloucester. So off the back of that, I was really keen to use one and I actually got my hands on one and was able to spend a couple of hours playing around with lots of different exercises and getting used to the K-Box. So from personal experience, getting out of the bottom of the squat, powering up and having the K-Box pull you through the floor on the way down is absolutely incredible. So basically, the harder you go on the concentric portion of the lift, the more it's gonna give you on the eccentric. So if you're gonna go for it, you're gonna get pulled through the floor. At simplyfaster.com, there's also a great blog from Frederick, who is one of the co-owners of Eccentric, so you can learn more about the K-Box there. So if you are interested in getting a K-Box, get to simplyfaster.com, so that's S-I-M-P-L-I, faster.com, and get a K-Box for yourself. Just before we get going, I had some very interesting feedback uh, over the last couple of weeks just regarding the intro. So from Andy Bayliss up at Sunderland Football Club, thank you very much for letting me know that I sound very camp um, and feminine on the start of the intros. So I'm uh, going to switch that up and eat some steak and, uh, and act like a man while I do the intro. Maybe speak a little bit deeper. So today we've got uh, Mark Bennett on the phone, who is the Head of Performance at Bristol Rugby. So I mentioned to Mark on the on the episode and afterwards that I think this is the most open anyone's been on the podcast with regards to their work. So today we discuss uh, the, his philosophy and how it's developed over the last 15 years. We discuss aerobic work for rugby and his, use, uh, his extensive use of circuits and how... Uh, the, Verkashansky uh, has influenced his practice. So one thing I would encourage you to do uh, after you've listened to the episode is get over on Twitter and follow Mark at EliteSC7 because he's putting some really good stuff out with regards to his data collection. So he's putting, basically, he goes to it in the episode, but he's, instead of putting it out in, in peer-reviewed articles, he's just putting the graphs out and the, the data out on, on Twitter. So get onto that and you can uh, you can see the kind of stuff Mark's doing with his, with his players. So just before we get onto the episode with Mark, I released last week the second webinar of the Pace Performance webinar series, and that is going to be with Ian McKeown from Port Adelaide, in the AFL. So it's going to be a great insight into AFL and athletic development from Ian, who is uh, an expert in that in that subject. So if you're interested, go to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Ian. And it is on Sunday the 29th of November, and that is at 10 a.m. Uh, GMT. So get over there, get over to Mark's Twitter, and let me know what you think of this episode. Hopefully you find it as as useful as I did, and I will speak to you soon. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we've got Mark Bennett on the phone, who is the Head of Performance at, at Bristol Rugby. So just before we get Mark in, just want to thank him for his time, and welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a chat. No worries. So do you want to give us a bit of information on your your background, your education, and what you're currently doing? Uh, Okay. Uh, I've been involved in uh, rugby since, uh, in some form or another, since the day I went professional in 1995. Uh, Prior to that, I I was playing uh, rugby uh, at at the highest level. I was lucky enough to represent my country and go to a World Cup. Um... When rugby turned professional in '95, uh, I, I became a full-time professional player, 
and uh, I sat in there really until I was about 31, 32, I think, and I retired in around about, I think it was the 1999 season. Um, at that point, uh, I was lucky enough to be, uh, I think things have changed a lot in the world of strength and conditioning, I was lucky enough to be uh, at Bristol at the time, and the the player coach there, I was quite friendly with him, and I was going to leave the game and go back to my uh, previous day job, which had been an industrial chemist, when, when he suggested to me, look, why don't you stay on as a, a strength and conditioning coach? There were very few people doing it then. He said, I think you could be good at this. Uh, I, I, so I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. So I went uh, part-time for my first summer, quickly realized it was something that I enjoyed and loved and became a, a full-time S&C coach at Bristol. So I had to do uh, most of my learning on the job, um, uh, going back to university, doing courses, uh, getting all my professional qualifications. I obviously had a, a reasonable amount of experience in rugby, which helped. Uh, I stayed at Bristol for maybe... That might have been five years when I came back to Wales. I think it was 2003 or 2004, I came back to Wales. And uh, I worked for the WRU then, setting up their regional academies initially. And then being uh, head of academy strength and conditioning, uh, for, for want of a better job title, where my remit was to sort of uh, coordinate the strength and conditioning that was going on in each of the uh, regions at the time the four regions. Uh, I was working under Andrew Hoare uh, from New Zealand at that time and when he left I managed to uh, pick up the, 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 the head role. Uh, so I was in charge of uh, the national team up until about 2009 when uh, I left for the Ospreys and I spent uh, uh, until Oh, last season, last season, my first season at Bristol, I moved from the Ospreys to Bristol to become uh, head of performance there. Um, I, I, I'd actually uh, spoken to Sean Holly, who's the head coach there, who I'd worked with on previous occasions about working there, and uh, went up to meet Danny Robinson. And when I saw the, the vision and the uh, outlook that they had for the club, it was a no-brainer for me, really. And I'm in my second season up there now and uh, really enjoying the role. It's given me a fresh piece of life, if I'm honest, after what's probably been, what, 15 or 16 years uh, in the industry. Veteran. Veteran Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what was it like going from being an amateur player to turning pro? Um, initially, it was uh, it was okay, if I'm honest. You, you know, people were realistic. The game sort of became semi-professional in the first year. We went to, uh, I, I remember going to play an international in uh, South Africa, and the game had literally turned professional overnight. I, th I think there was, uh, uh, we were sort of amateur one day, professional the next, and, and the first game that I got paid for was Wales versus South Africa. So it was a strange situation where, you were on tour, so you, you were training as a professional with anybody. Then when we came back and we signed professional contracts at the clubs, they were uh, semi-professional contracts more. So even though we, we were expected to train three evenings a week uh, and continue with our own fitness regimes, and uh, I probably trained quite hard as an amateur anyway. You know, I don't think professional rugby players realise now how much work would go in at the top level. So I'd get up in the morning. And I might go for a run, uh, you know, on a Monday morning, I'd go for a run, I'd work all day, then I'd come home and go to the gym. On a Tuesday, I'd go to the gym, then go to club training. On a Wednesday, I'd do some fitness. On a Thursday, I'd go to the gym, do club training. So I had pretty much a, you, you had to fit your training around your work. And, and you now became in a situation where you had free time to train in the day and you went to train with your club two or three evenings a week. So it started to pick up, um, the following season and we did a, a full-time pre-season uh, and got into it but I actually didn't find the transition too bad you know I, I'd always enjoyed weight training I'd always enjoyed fitness probably more than the game itself if I'm honest so so that part of the game uh, I didn't struggle with I did struggle with the fact that uh, I had to do I, I, I didn't have a big attention span when it came to rugby when it came to rugby playing so I did struggle with the fact that we had to do uh, line outs every day and rugby every day and 
uh, I can be sympathetic with the way some of the players feel now because I can imagine how I feel in the modern game. I mean, it's pretty full on uh, and, and it's difficult. But saying that, it, it, it's still a nice way to make a living. So what was your job? You mentioned in the, in the chat we had beforehand. What was your job previous to going pro? I'd been involved in uh, water treatment chemistry. So I used to go to uh, industrial sites and uh, maybe it would be, uh, you know, I can think of an example now where I went to a zinc smelter and they would have, um, obviously they use a lot of water on site in these processes, these industrial processes, and they would uh, have to remove that water from site by a discharge into a river or the sea. So you can't really throw out water when it's full of zinc, cadmium, arsenic, lead, all those heavy metals. So I'd look at ways of removing heavy metals from water or, or protecting systems against rust, corrosion, those sort of things. So it was really a chemistry background my job was. And um, as a young man, I probably didn't do it the justice I should have. And, and I think if I look back at it now, it would probably be quite a, an interesting job now and something I'd enjoy now. But uh, at the time, it was uh, it was torturous. It was a way to get through a day <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and allow me to go to the gym in the evening or, or play rugby. And it was just a means to an end. Yeah, of course. So talking about transitions, what was the transition like going from being a player and going through all that from amateur to pro and then to a coach? What was that transition like? Oh, well, I've been through it, you know, the, the, uh, the day that I made the decision to retire was, was, was a very difficult decision. It was, uh, um, it's almost a feeling that a part of your life has ended and you're no longer good enough or young enough to do that anymore. So the actual day that I, I, I retired, it was, I can remember, it was very, very difficult and it was quite emotional. But I think being lucky enough to be involved in the game and to be so engrossed and interested by uh, the world of strength and conditioning and, and the differences you can make to players and uh, has, has meant that since that day, I really haven't missed playing, I can be honest. There have been times when I played for Wales, uh, when I was coaching Wales or, or, or the Ospreys, when you'd be involved in a, a big game, a European match or, or a Grand Slam decider, where you'd be in the changing rooms beforehand and you go out in the field and you'd see the crowd and the atmosphere would be unreal and you think, oh, you know, I, I'd give anything to be back and play today. But then when, when that whistle goes and you see people smashing each other, <laughs> each other, I think to myself, oh, you know, no, I'm happy where I am. I've had my time. I'm done. You know, leave these guys do it. So just before we get into the, the training chat, how, how has your philosophy developed since you've uh, since you made that transition to be a coach? Well, I think when we start off as uh, strength and conditioning coaches, we see what worked for us and we try to mirror that in what we do. Now, when I was playing rugby, there was very little knowledge in the, in, in the way of uh, S&C as a whole. So weight training was, was sort of a mixture of bodybuilding and weightlifting. You know, you would try and do your speed work like a sprinter. You'd be trying to do interval running like a, an 800-meter runner or a 400-meter runner. And you'd be just trying to amalgamate all these programs in, in, into one. Um, so w when I started, I certainly made those mistakes that, you know, uh, we, we have to try and bring all these things together, realizing that at the end of the day, you're only trying to produce a, a rugby player. So I, I do hope that I've evolved, that my program has gone from a get strong, get fit, get fast program to one that, that, that tries to develop uh, the physical requirements needed to play high level rugby union. Some things haven't changed. You know, I, I, I do believe, I did believe then and I do believe now that uh, the deciding factor between elite level players and those below it, what separates them at some point or another are, are factors like explosive strength, um, and the ability to produce power. Uh, th those are the things that make the, uh, the differentiate between the best and the not so good. So that has always been the basis of my program. And, and uh, I think I think will always be, I can't see a time where that will change. So when you talk about building that explosive athlete, how do you have, how have you gone about that uh, over the last 15 years and how do you go about it now? <sighs> You know, things have changed. Initially, I would—I uh, I can remember. Um, we're talking 15, 15 years ago. 
and uh, I had some knowledge of periodization. It was very, there was very little knowledge around. I remember picking up an article that I read on Mike Stone that Mike Stone had written, and it was uh, discussing the, the periodization of uh, throwers. So th that had stuck with me, and, and initially I, I was sort of doing a uh, a hybrid program of um, Olympic lifting and powerlifting uh, to to try to make players strong and uh, powerful and the sort of power stages of those programs would simply be uh, high intensity heavy sets of work with um, low reps along the Schmidt Bleicher research lines where you know you can produce um, maximal rate of force development through trying to move weights as fast as you can if they're heavy. Now, I still do that, but 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 over the years, I I, uh, I had a, a eureka moment for me. One day, where I where I picked up um, uh, Vergashansky's first edition of uh, I think it's called the Special Strength Training Manual for Coaches. I think the name of the book was, and I, and I read that, and it, it made a lot of things fall into place for me. It made me realize that you're not actually trying to make uh, uh, an Olympic lifter or, a, or, or a, an Olympic throw who can run fast on the field and manage to do that for 80 minutes. You're actually trying to produce a rugby player. So his periodization paradigms really s sunk in with me and, 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 and to the point where they made, made sense in, a, in, a, in lots and lots of ways. They suited the game. They suited the, the way the season was structured. So I, over the years, I've gone from trying to just produce a, a strong, powerful man who can manage a game for 80 minutes. Uh, you've got a lot of a lot of things that don't go together there to just producing an explosive rugby player. Cool. So, so in, during the week, what does your week, how will your week look like to fit in the components to to build that explosiveness in that rugby player? I think it, it takes a step back. Is that I don't look at things on a uh, a week by week. You have you have a very small amount of time. Rugby is a it's a it's a very general sport, and by general I mean that the athletes aren't very specialised. They don't have to be. Um, they, they don't only focus on being explosive. They don't only focus on being aerobically fit. They don't only focus on being strong. You know, they have to do all of those things and it has to be some specific fitness, you know, as long as, as well as being able to handle a the ball. They have a huge amount of training volume to get through. People don't, you know, it's, it's one of the most difficult sports in the world to train for, I feel. Uh, and I don't mean difficulty in terms of effort. I mean, in terms of what needs to be covered. You know, when I look at the forwards, they have to learn to scrummage. They have to practice scrummaging. They have to do line outs. They have to do kickoffs. They have to do defensive work. They have to do rucks, they have to do mauls, they have to do, you know, attacking options. They have all of these things to do and, and, and then behind that you have to follow that up with some sort of program for, for fitness. Now, when you think on a weekly basis that uh, if you play on a Saturday, uh, Sunday and Monday are, are quite often wiped out. There, there's very little a player can do that will um, improve his fitness long term. You can't load him on a Sunday or a Monday, it's difficult. Uh, so you have Tuesday, depending on your week structure, you may have Wednesday and Thursday. So you may have two or three days a week where you can load players. Now, one of the things that appealed to me about Verkashansky's periodization model or block loading was that you have a, uh, a period where you really put your efforts into uh, improving one or two physical components and because you, you only have two week, two days a week available that's that's relatively easy to do you can spend two days where you can have a large load for maximum strength and a load for aerobic work in and you don't have to worry about looking after your speed or your explosive strength or your reactivity or your special uh, strength or your specific fitness then during the next block you can move on to explosive work and you can move on to specific fitness. So you, you can spend sh the relatively small periods of time you have available on a weekly basis can be spent looking after one or two factors. Now, I, I find it difficult to visualize how people can, if you have 
with all the work a player does, if, if you if you get three sessions and they're playing on a weekly basis, if you get three sessions to work with that player every week, so maybe three hours, four hours of work with that player, and the player is is reasonably fit, reasonably strong, reasonably fast, I can't see how you can distribute enough training time to cover off maximal strength, speed, explosive strength, agility. You can't do all of these things uh, and actually make a difference. You, you tread in water all the time. If I can spend my two hours a week for four weeks trying to get a player stronger, I can make a difference. Then I can move on to the next component of fitness. So the, the major thing that appeal that appealed to me and uh, set me up to do this type of work wasn't so much that um, if you had an athlete working eight hours a day, this would be better. It, it fitted in with the paradigms of rugby, small amounts of time and a lot of work to cover. I don't know if that makes sense. No, definitely, definitely. So how, how often would you revisit the qualities that you've, you've previously built on? Um, you know, if you read the, the literature, uh, he will talk about, uh, y y you know, how long fitness uh, el elements are stable for. And, and, and depending on the time of year, I will try and, I could, uh, if you can picture a year, I will put together, when I, when I sit down and do my year plan, I will put together, I'll simply fill out a schedule, which will be block A, block B, block C, block D. I, I would just call them that block A would be a period of time where, where I work on my, um, my base fitness components for rugby, what, what builds the bottom of the pyramid. So for me personally, and other people may think different, differently, I think the two, support, or the two supporting components of fitness for me at the bottom are maximal strength. Players, uh, you know, if you think the literature tells us that uh, the heavier the object you handle in your sport, the, the, the more important maximum strength is. Well, rugby players handle objects that are between 85 and 125 kilograms heavy. They look, at, they look after their opposite number. So that tells me that maximal strength is very important. They're trying to push away, throw, uh, pull very heavy objects. So the base of my period is maximal strength, and they have to repeat that for uh, 80 minutes or so with some bouts of low intensity running in between. So they have to be able to recover creatine phosphate really quickly, ATP very quickly, and be able to reproduce that. So that tells me that the aerobic system has to be extremely important as well. So, so my block A is always uh, built around developing maximal strength and uh, aerobic capacity and power. I then move into a block B sequence. Uh, you know, periodization is still sequential. You have to build on it and my next block would look at um uh being becoming more explosive so moving weights quicker you know doing plyometrics those sorts of things and uh, at the same time trying to improve uh, local muscular endurance so that's a term that people sort of get confused with a little bit so i think that uh when, when we look at um sport we see that uh, you can have central adaptations for uh, fitness, which would be um, you, you, you know, uh, blood volume, stroke volume for your heart, uh, red blood cell count, etc., etc. Then there are also peripheral adaptations, which would be capillarization, your ability to uh, exchange oxygen at the cells that are actually working, uh, the enzyme content of those cells, mitochondria within those cells. So when you try and improve local muscular endurance, what you're actually doing at that point is you're trying to uh, put so much pressure on the, the local muscles that are actually involved in your sport that you overcompensate with capillarization, if, if that makes sense. So you're actually trying to improve the efficiency of the athlete at the muscles at work. So that would be my block B. Then block C, I would look at being uh, specific. So that is where I would do what other people would term specific fitness. And I'm sure that some things I do uh, in that phase are, are similar to other people and some things are different. And lastly, I would have a, a block D, which is a realization block. The players have worked hard, so I'd give them a little bit of downtime, set sessions a little easier, intensity still high, and we try and allow ourselves to get ready for the next block. Now, as the season progresses, because I'm trying to build a base, initially my block A, which is maximal strength and uh, aerobic endurance, could be very long. So it could be five to six weeks long, 
So we'd only work on that component. And the explosive strength phase might be quite short and the specific, specific phase might only be one week. But as the season moves on and we're getting towards the important games at the end of the playoffs, come February, we may be looking at uh, a one one week to a 10 day block of maximal strength, that one week, 10 day block of maximal strength where we look to uh, just revisit it quickly to make sure we're not losing it. Explosive strength may be two to three weeks long and then the specific phase of work maybe uh, you know five weeks of five weeks in length and, and I'm confident that I can I can go those periods of time uh, without worrying too much about it if, if a player has squatted heavily twice a week for um, four or five four to five week blocks coming up to Christmas then I know that having three or four five weeks away from squatting his squat may drop a little bit but he'll soon learn, he'll soon gain that when he comes back into the gym and practices it. But but his 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 actual strength, his ability to produce force on the on the field, won't have changed too dramatically. And if anything, it may have improved. Uh, you know, you get a, a lagging training effect, and just removing the volume of squatting, he'll, he'll become more explosive. He'll become stronger. So I'm quite confident that you can go as long as a player has a history of training, and you can go for relatively long periods of time without. Uh, lifting heavy weights, revisiting aerobic fitness, uh, and you, you, you know the markers that we use, such as uh, when we measure. Uh, you know, I'm pretty confident that if uh, if lean muscle mass isn't changing, then players are maintaining the gains that we have. Uh, and, and, and I'm happy. I don't know if that's really answers. Or no, I'm definitely, that's great. That's great. I didn't say anything because I just wanted like, to let you run. That was great. Um, so I just want to touch on the uh, the block A and the the aerobic work that you talk about because you use a lot of um, you use circuits quite extensively. Do you want to do you want to talk to us a little bit about the use of circuits and kind of building that aerobic base? Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, 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 there are there are three types of circuits I'll use when I train. Um, I'll use uh, we'll come back to these. I mean, I'll use ones to build um, aerobic endurance or aerobic power. I will use circuits to build uh, local muscular endurance, and I will use certain circuits for um, sports specific training. And, and they'll all look different and have different outcomes. And the main the main reasons that I use them for uh, aerobic training, uh, aerobic power and aer aer aerobic endurance are, um, I think num number one for me, if you follow a player on the field, uh, he, and you look at what he does work-wise, it's not just running, he has to get up and down off the floor, he has to pull, he has to push, he has to do all sorts of different tasks, it's extremely general, so if we have an expectation of developing and I know aerobic training, it's general in my mind, but so I have to be careful of how it is. If we want to develop specific aerobic fitness, then it has to be more than just running orientated. There has to be some task specificity in it. You know, we, we, the, the arms are used, the shoulders are used, the back is used extensively. So I will use circuits because it produces um, aerobic development uh, in, in all areas of the body, not just the legs. So that, that's the first reason. The second reason is, um, w w we during that first block, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to produce more of a, a central adaptation than I am uh, a peripheral ad adaptation. So I'm happy that if my heart rate is correct and uh, I, I'm at the right intensity that I'm going to get central adaptations to a, a aerobic development. Now, if I'm continually running, I'm also starting to get those peripheral adaptations and I'm putting a huge amount of um, load through my legs, which is starting to compromise my maximal strength development. I'm also trying to develop strength in this block. So if I can go away from using my legs and develop my central adaptations in a, in a different way, I'm likely to get more of my strength block. We all know the research, and I, and I know it myself. If you do a lot of running, you will struggle to develop strength. You'll struggle even more to become explosive. So the, the, the reason, you know, there, there is a rhyme between the reason. People just think it's a, a circuit, but it's not. And then when I set up the circuits, the circuits will be set up to enable me to uh, ensure that uh, if I'm doing two-minute intervals, 
uh, you know, there may be 15 seconds of uh, work for your lower body into 15 seconds work of pushing into 15 seconds work of pulling with the upper body. So uh, the work is distributed fairly evenly about the body. So I think that it means that when you do a four to five week block of strength on top of that, you're not compromising your development and, and, and you get the gains more quickly. So it means you don't have to spend as much time if you need to gain 5%, 10%, whatever, or, or just get better at being strong, then putting circuits in is going to help that happen. It's not going to hinder it. Mm. So what were the two types of circuits that you mentioned there? Uh, local muscular endurance. So here now I've, I, I've developed my maximal strength and I've developed my central adaptations to fitness. Now I'm trying to uh, improve efficiency of movement on the actual musculature or, or improvement of uh, energy production in the actual musculature that's utilized a lot so it may be that uh, you would do a circuit that would be a sort of uh, uh, it's difficult to describe this movement without um, without seeing it uh, I don't know if you've ever seen people do kettlebell leaps where you sort of hold a kettlebell at arm's length between your legs and you jump as high as you can right, okay yeah, so that, that would be a sort of movement that if you did that for maximal height, which would be very good at uh, developing explosive power. But if you can imagine, if you could do that movement and you went up and down to full extension, but you made every movement rhythmical and you sort of bounced, so you were maybe, you know, literally a quarter of an inch or two to three millimeters off the floor, and you had a, uh, a clock on the wall in front of you, and you're trying to keep that movement at a specific rate of, one jump, two jump, three jumps. So in 10 seconds, you're doing 10 small jumps. You can actually quite quickly uh, uh, fatigue legs and, and, and produce a lot of lactic acid in those systems and, and, and which will, which will uh, uh, improve uh, energy uh, uh, production or the, the body's ability to improve energy production. So you can put circuits together with those in, into lunge jumps, into um, uh, uh, jumps onto a bench into uh, small Bulgarian squat jumps where you continually work in one muscle group on a small circuit for maybe 40 to 50 seconds and you can get a huge amount of uh, improvements in your peripheral adaptations for, uh, for, for running and fitness without doing a huge volume of running. So that would be the second type of circuit. Um, then the third type of circuit I would tend to do would be in my um, final block of, of work, which would be a, a, a specific block. So when we think about the uh, specificity of sport, it's important to realize that, that uh, not only does rugby involve uh, moving heavy objects, it involves moving heavy objects when you're fatigued, when you're under duress. So it, there's no point in being strong if you can't produce high levels of strength uh, whilst fatigued. So that's not strength endurance. Strength endurance would be the ability to, to, to work one, one muscle group to failure at a relatively high level of intensity. But, but strength under duress is a different factor. It mean, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's the ability to run somewhere and then perform a high intensity task. So specific circuits have to... Um, mimic that so a specific circuit for me for rugby would be something where you might do you know five to six explosive bench press on uh, 100 kilos and then you'd move across to do uh, 10 maximal height squat jumps with a barbell only 20 kilos maybe you know and and, and then you'd move from there to do dumbbell rows or prone poles then you'd be doing some sprints some jump work so you so you try in in in, in effect to to mimic the uh, uh, high intensity components of the game that where you have to produce maximal force or or or, or, or be explosive, but you then have to have a, a very small rest period and go and do something else, a different task. So you may have to tackle, get up, get down, perform in a ruck, you know. Uh, run with the ball, then you may have to run 50 to 60 meters uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, to try to get back in defense. So you're trying to put together a circuit uh, within the gym that, 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 that is actually replicating the uh, events that are occurring on the field. And I think, I think it's important to realize as well that um, 
one of the things I've always been very conscious of is that when we train for sport, uh, we have to produce overload. So uh, unless you're rehabbing an injury or you're trying to prevent an injury, uh, every exercise you're trying to do uh, at, at some point has to overload something, some physical component or strength component of the competition exercise. If it doesn't overload it, you can't get any transfer. You, 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 you can't, so if, if uh, and I'm gonna completely make up some figures here, if, if a prop forward uh, produces, I don't know, uh, 5,000 Newtons through his legs when he pushes in a scrum, and I'm doing a strength exercise that doesn't produce 5,000 Newtons, then I can't be making him better at scrummaging. I'm doing something else. You may as well scrummage. The competitive exercise is at a higher intensity. It's, of, uh, it's producing more duress. So you cannot do an exercise that produces 2,000 Newtons and expect it to make him a better scrummager. So during the, the, all of these periods of work, it, it, you have to have a realization that you, if you want to improve uh, maximal strength, explosive strength, uh, specific fitness, the, the way you do it has to be harder for that particular physical quality than the competition exercise. Or you may as well just go away and practice the competition because you get better at it. Mm -hmm. no, I understand. So you mentioned there's, a, there's quite a few references to kind of jumping exercises there. Yeah. How, how would you manage your bigger guys when it comes to that kind of activity? Um, we, we, I, I'm, I'm progressive in my jumping. So uh, progressive in my jumping, both in terms of uh, a season and in terms of a uh, career. So um, I'm not going to come in and ask a 120 kilogram prop to do depth jumps off 60 centimeter boxes. It doesn't happen to start with. But you know, you can use a heavy kettlebell, and you can uh, you can use 32 kilogram kettlebells, and you can develop quite a lot of explosive force with that early early on in an athlete's career. Uh, they can't jump very high with them, but they can produce force quickly, so it's not too stressful on their feet, ankles, knees. Uh, those who are successful in that, they can move on to uh, heavier barbell jumps. Uh, and I'd actually put lighter kettlebell jumps probably further down uh, or further along in my, my staging, simply because players jump higher. So when they're landing, there's a, you know, a 16 kilogram kettlebell for me puts far more force through your ankles and uh, knees and hips on landing than a 32 kilogram. And I, I, it, it's a little bit of, um, you know, live and learn. So as long as you are progressive, you quite quickly have a realization before any damage is done of, of people who can withstand these type of exercises and people who can't. And and, and I think the, the other factor, you know, I, I've been, I've seen, I've seen prop forwards and uh, second rows who are able to withstand this type of training, but I've also seen those who can't. And, and I think it's also important to realize that because you're doing, uh, so, or because of the pattern of periodization that I follow, it would be very small periods of highly strenuous jumping. It's, it's two weeks here, two weeks there. So it's, it's maybe it, it's four weeks of uh, depth jumps, four weeks of, uh, four sessions of depth jumps, four sessions of, barbell jumps or, or four sessions of kettlebell jumps or mixtures of these things and they're interwoven or separated by by long periods of no jumping where they're developing maximum strength uh they're developing explosive strength with other methodologies so they recover quite well from them mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting thanks a lot for that it's really uh, it's great detail so we talked we talked a little before about your the amount of data that you've collected over the years mm -hmm. and you've set up a twitter account to uh kind of siphon that off and get that out there you just want to talk about the kind of data that you are collecting the type of data that has become important to you and your programming yeah um well uh, you know data collection now it's it's, it's become uh, unbelievable in some ways the amount of data that people are collecting and uh, um you know, over the years, my data would simply have started off with things that I've tested for and volumes of training. So, you know, uh, I'd be looking at uh, from the very beginning, at the beginning, 15 years ago, I have data which simply relates to uh, how many intervals players did in a day, 
uh, how many bench press, at what weight, how many squats at what weight, and what were the results 12 weeks later. And then it's become more and more sophisticated over the years, uh, you know, uh, having a realization of the power of uh, Excel was enormous for me, and, and, and sitting down and uh, uh, discovering what, what it could actually do. Uh, and then after that, uh, you know, using, taking one step further, looking at R, which is a, a fantastic computer program which can do so much for you. But uh, I went through a period for, for three, maybe four years where I collected everything I could possibly get my hands on. So I, I looked at um, uh, jump heights, uh, body weights, uh, heart rate variability uh, on a daily basis, collecting this data. Um, uh, feedback from GPS data, so everything that the GPS data would give me. Um, look then, I, I added into that um, uh, performance scores from players during games, so so players will get marked at, 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 uh, at the, the, the coaching staff at the clubs and with Wales I've worked with would mark players on a on a game by game basis, so players would get points for defensive actions, offensive actions, work rate, use, looking at that data and feeding it in. And then after 12 months of data collection, going back uh, and, and putting in huge correlation matrices and, you know, uh, and, and trying to find um, uh, the magic formula that, that, that uh, uh, would, 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 would look for performance and injury uh, susceptibility, these sorts of things. And uh, after last year, uh, I, I made the decision that I, I was I was a little worried doing it over the years that I was missing something that um, people were using all this data and uh, they were going to get some advantage over me. But I made the decision last year that they weren't. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty certain that there's a lot of data collection going on at the moment where where, where people uh, collect data for data collection's sake. It, it's almost become the emperor's clothes where. Uh, everybody else is doing it, so I have to do it. I feel I need to do it, but not many people act on that data. So I, I, I've actually gone away and I have looked at sort of three years of work and, and, and tried to make some decisions on the uh, on the data that I can actually change training for on individuals and make a difference. So it, I, I, I've I've cut it down quite a lot now, and, and we, I'm at the point where. I'm confident that if I get, uh, you know, player to, players to jump when they come into work, players to weigh when they come into work, uh, the physio department do a, a sit and reach test. That, 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 that those are the three major things for me that actually make a difference, and I can uh, decide, or, or, or we can decide as departments whether players work on that day or not, or have a lighter load. Um, they, they. They, they actually tell us a lot about whether a player is likely to get injured or, or the chances of him getting injured. Um, and and uh, I couldn't find these relationships elsewhere. So in, in terms of data collection, I've, I, I've come a long way. I've done a lot and I've actually cut back where I'm going. Now I'm sure that there are going to be ways to, to look at data and collect data and, and, and find things that I've missed. But I think it's going to take an awful lot of man hours and a lot of staff to do that, or some very complicated computer programs. It's not something I can do at the moment. The one stipulation I would have on this is that um, probably the best bit of data or, or, or the most relevant data that I've seen over the last three years for me has been heart rate variability. Um, heart rate variability has been uh, in two different clubs, with two different sets of staff, it's been a very, very good predictor of uh, likely injury rate within a, uh, a squad. So based on average levels of heart rate variability on a weekly basis, I, I'm, I'm able to predict whether injury rates are going to be high or low in the coming games. Um, what I was unable to do was predict which players could get injured. <laughs> So it, I would I have this data where I would say that you know our heart rate variability has fall, fallen. We're going to get a lot of injuries this week. Who's going to get injured? I don't know. So it becomes data that's worthless in effect. 
So it's it, 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 it's it's a difficult scenario. You're collecting data, but I can't actually. You're collecting data that tells you something, but it's data that I can't act on. So uh, why am I collecting it? Now I, I I have some ideas on that. I think rather than just looking at averages and players who uh, you, you know I use the ice fleet system, which is very good, and and rather than looking at players who just going into the red, I think that I need to go back and look at day to day variance players who whose hard rate variability changes a lot, uh, goes up and down. Uh, they are the guys who are, who are possibly the ones who are likely to get injured. And, and, and it's how we, we monitor those players or control the volumes of training of those players uh, more, more effectively. So I am trying to initiate uh, something. One of the guys that works in my department is keen to do a project on it. So we are trying to reinitiate that. So we will collect a little bit more data uh, on that. Very interesting. So on the um, so the athlete uh, system, you'd have to do that on on your end rather than within the system itself to so, get out what to get out what you want. Yes. So we, we look at um, you know the, the the way we simply ran the the, the IT system was we bought we bought the monitors and I bought a, a license for the it's like an online application that uh, the players will uh, log on. Or, or the players measure their their heart rate variability when they get up in the morning using their uh, mobile phone, their smartphone, and that sends the results straight through to the uh, app for me, so I can get into work in the morning. You can look at heart rate variability, but unless somebody has a you know a very obvious defect, it's still difficult to. There, there were so many occasions when we made the decision. You know, we'd come in and if, if a player had an issue with his HRV. Uh, then we'd look at his uh, readiness scores for the day, his sit and reach test, his, uh, you know, his, his uh, glute strength, his uh, ankle mobility, and we try to make decisions based on that. And there were times when players were poor and they trained and they had no injuries, and there were times when players were good and they trained and they did have injuries. So it was it was still very difficult to to, to manage and uh, lower um, injury rates, which is which is what we're looking for with those sorts of systems. Um, so, so it, it's finding a way to do it better and becoming more individual. In, individuality is very difficult to do when um, when you have forty five to fifty players to look after, and you're making a decision at uh, eight o'clock in the morning on those fifty players about who can train at eight <laughs> thirty. It's 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 hard to do. So you have to have something that's that's meaningful and uh, and also reasonably successful because. Uh, you, know, you know, even the even the best uh, technical and ta tactical coaches are going to get pretty fed up when you're playing, pulling players all of the time, and you're not uh, lowering injury rates. Mm -hmm. you're you've, not got, you've got to have a very supportive coaching staff. Yeah, you have, you have, because at the end of the day, they're there to play rugby. You know, and and over the years, I've seen some some interesting, and, and you know, you know, I've got a realization that the correlation isn't causality, but. But, you know, I've actually seen over the years that in weeks where we get high injury rates in training, those are the weeks where the, teams performs, the team performs the best. So there's a difficult scenario here where you're trying to manage injury rates, but actually when injury rates are high, we perform better. So, you know, sometimes it may be that you, to be at your best, you may have to occasionally have a sacrificial lamb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sacrificial lambs aren't your best players. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pushing it to the limit. Yeah. yeah, you know. So probably you know it's, it's high intensity training, high training load. It may cause injuries, but also causes good performances. Mm. Cool. That's that's really interesting. I mean, I, I'm keeping you. Um, I know you've got a day off today, so I don't want to ruin your whole day. But um, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've kept you 45 minutes um, up until now, so I just want to kind of round it up a little bit. And we talked we talked about your your Twitter account that you you put some of your um, data out there for people to kind of interpret on their own. Do you just want to talk, um, give us your Twitter handle? Um, is it Elite SC7? Is that correct? That's it. Yes. Cool. So uh, that's obviously. Um, you put you putting things out there that maybe have potential to be uh, to be written up into into articles, but due to time, I'm guessing you're not. Yeah, it's 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 quite easy. You know, uh, if you if you're quite good at keeping data in spreadsheets, it's really easy to run uh, uh, mathematical or statistical uh, 
uh, analysis. It's very easy to do. What, what, what's time consuming is, uh, is to, to write a, a, a literature review, to do your conclusions, to do all those other bits and bobs that are needed before you can get uh, work published. And, and earlier on in my career, I was, I, I was quite keen to get stuff published and, 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 and did it. But uh, as I've got older and perhaps a little bit more secure, I don't worry about it as much. And if people want me to take part in a study, I'm happy to do it, but I'm not spending any time writing things up. Um, so I, I, I thought, I'm, I'm keen to share data and, and, and let people know. So I thought it's, it's an easy way to do it. I mean, uh, uh, social networking is great. It just lets you put things out there. And um, you don't see, I don't put any opinions out there. I simply try to show people, well, if you do, 12 weeks of aerobic work with rugby players, this is what you can expect at the end, or this is what I've had at the end, you know, and, and, and try to show people changes in fitness, changes in body composition that occur, or whatever I've got, really, and, I, and I'll just keep on. It's finding, finding time to do that. If I have an hour free here or there, I'll try to put two or three things on it and, and just try to keep leaking them out. No, that's great. I mean, for, for, for kind of young coaches like, like myself, it's, it's great from, to have people like you put that kind of information out there. Well, so, yeah, yeah, that's the idea. To, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. So I'll, I'll kind of um, I'll finish there, but I just want to thank you for your, your the kind of open uh, response that you gave there. So that was uh, that was great. So thanks again, and uh, we'll keep in touch, Mark. If that's all right. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, mate. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode fifty-eight of the Pace of Performance podcast. I hope you enjoy the chat with Mark. Like I said at the start, get over to Twitter and follow Mark at Elite SC7 and check out some of the stuff that he's been doing with his, uh, with his athletes down at Bristol. So just a little reminder, again, like I said at the start, the Pace Performance webinar series number two with Ian McKeough from Port Adelaide in the AFL is going to happen on the 29th of November at 10 a.m. GMT. So if you are interested in learning all about athletic development and at the AFL, you can go to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Ian. You can also check out all previous episodes of the podcast if you go to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast. Massive thanks to today's sponsor, simplyfaster.com and I will speak to you all soon.